Okay. Um, well, thank you everyone for coming today. And it gives me, I have to say, a very special pleasure to introduce Solveig Gott because Solveig, um, not only is she a really most inspiring textile artist, but um, I had the honor, privilege of being her PhD supervisor um, a few years ago. And I have to say that it, this was, for me, one of the most exciting learning experiences I've had as a teacher because Solveig, and I think you'll see this today in her work, Solveig asks us really to think about, about narrative and lives and things and objects in a quite, in a most imaginative way, which really calls on all sorts of your being, not just your brain. And, um, and often with Solveig, um, you end up touching a lot of things and feeling them and, smell, and watching them change colors and everything. So we've really missed Solveig, and um, I think that also in terms of the novella project, um, which is very much concerned with the everyday, with narratives in everyday, which is Solveig's work, I think we'll have a lot to take away from that. Um, so as you see, we, we've gotten, we've lost just a few minutes, not a lot. Solveig will talk for about an hour, and then we'll have time at the end for questions and discussion and the rest. We also have um, the evaluation forms, most of you I don't have to say this to, um, you know that for the NCRM it's really critical that we have these completed um, for a record of the event, if nothing else. And um, I don't think there's anything else I need to say. So thank you so much, Solveig, for coming. It's really exciting to hear you again. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, that quote what I've put, that I've put up there is about the complexities and complications of narrative, and both complexities and complications are terms of textile goods, actually. <clears throat> so rather than picking out just one particular narrative thread to follow, I'm drawing you into an entanglement of words and images, theory and practice, with plenty of loose threads to get lost in. Okay, there we are. Uh, working as a textile artist, investigating themes of identity and memory, I've become intrigued by the power of the ordinary, the strong emotions that are evoked and sustained by such humble items as curtains, socks, blankets, towels, or pajamas in people's life stories. <coughs> the domestic textiles at the core of our material experience while in daily use seem ordinary items of little significance beyond the obvious. Yet from the moment we are born, and long before we can speak, we are in touch with textiles. My body, Merleau-Ponty says, is the fabric into which all objects are woven, but some, we might say, more clearly than others. As Judith Atfield observes with regard to the transitional object, it hardly needs to be observed that textiles have a particularity which cannot be replaced by, say, a tractor or a needle. Uh, humans started to clothe their bodies 190,000 years ago. Ever since, not only our bodies and environments, but also our memories, thoughts, and theories have been clothed. Virginia Woolf's first memory is of her mother's dress, not her face. The arrival of a new sibling may be remembered through the blanket the baby is wrapped in, the death of a grandparent through the curtains being closed. <coughs> uh, from vests and lucky underpants, sheets and carpets, curtains and covers, to uniforms and flags, beer tents and parachutes, wires and cables, from digital networks to string theory and the twisted strands of DNA, we live in a world heavily layered with textiles, a truly world wide web. Human life without textiles is unimaginable. Folds, entanglements and creases, comfort and restrain, interwoven strands, loose ends, unraveling threads, seams and knots, wear and tear, invention and imagination, magic and symbolism are all embedded in the fabrics of our life. Um, we are thinkers, makers, players, and storytellers, but whatever we might be and do, we are also textile selves. Textile knowledge is not acquired through formal instruction or textbooks, 
but literally carried as tacit knowledge on our skin throughout all our endeavors. Through textiles, Heidi Helmholtz writes, the everyday enters into academia and ends up in and in between all disciplines. So we understand the relationship between first and second skin without much explanation. And there's another example of textiles standing in for the body, vulnerabil vulnerabilities of the body given expression in injuries to the fabric skin. Um, and these also suggest restorative uh, textile practices of healing damage inflicted through care and repair, mending and patching. So in textiles, in material and metaphor, there is an inherent tension, an imminent movement of interweaving and unraveling, stitching and snipping, looping and fraying. I use collecting and making as narrative methods in a process that aims to relate the threads of everyday textile experience to lines of thought or knowledge of the embodied self and thus arrive at suggestions for new spaces and models of knowledge. <clears throat> in academic discourse, the embodied self tends to be a naked concept bereft of its material shell in relation to unspecified objects and others. But however abstracted from the materiality of lived experience such writing may be, textile knowledge reveals itself in metaphors of folds and threads, knots and weaves in the fabric of life. As the mind and thinking itself are embodied and shaped by bodily experiences and interactions, both in daily life and in theoretical discourse, everyday textiles are central and essential, rendered marginal only by force of habit. Habit in research, art and daily life is a double-edged sword, important and appropriate to have automatic responses and useful orders of concepts and categories to act and think, but to sense the extraordinary in the ordinary, we need, in Bergson's word, attentive recognition, the power to value the useless, and the will to dream. The textile knowledge emerges in felt experiences and can be traced in our stories and memories. Narrative relates the uniqueness of each individual self and life story to the universality of human experience within an intricate web of mutuality. <coughs> Art and narrative, both relational practices, bring into consciousness the diversity of potential links to be made and imagined in investigations of the fabric of life. In art practice, as in storytelling, it is, Tim Ingold says, in the movement from place to place or from topic to topic that knowledge is integrated. Uh, my line of inquiry is a meandering one, continuous yet unplanned and unpredictable, led by curiosity and serendipity. While for many researchers, as Cocker notes, meandering might imply a straying from the disciplinary path for the artist, it is a method of choice. So research proceeds, in Tassidadin's words, through a meandering, ill-informed thought process where the minutest of incidents can and have instructed major decisions. As Masumi advises, take joy in your digressions because that is where the unexpected arises. Narrative 
uh, is an imaginative process of weaving a fabric of cohesion, as Jens Brockmeier says, pictures and words, imagery and narrativity interwoven in one and the same semiotic fabric of meaning. It is not about facts, orders and certainties, but about finding meaning and therefore closer to the truth of lived experience and more scientifically valid than more detached and seemingly more objective methods, as Mark Freeman suggests. Narrative inquiry, he says, is where science and story, indeed science and art, meet. Newer science suggests that thinking itself is a narrative process, the self no more than a useful fiction to make sense of the past, retrospectively, thinking always following action. As the eye and imagination are faster than the word, visual stories have been used as memory aids from ancient memory theatres to modern day memory contests. We are born into stories as we are into textiles. The everyday textiles at the heart of my research can be understood as the literal fabric of life in sustaining and supporting the body, narrative as a metaphorical fabric of life creating a sense of self through meaning making. In conjunction, we may say they are held body and soul together. <clears throat> Collecting is a narrative process of gathering things in patterns of meaning. In Matthias Vincent's words, the imaginative process of association turned material. Collecting and narrative are both meaning-making methods from the toolbox of everyday life. Collecting helps to gain control of the complexity of the world, but it can also become a life in itself. As my mother was a hoarder, I'm well aware of the darker side of collecting. From an outside viewpoint, there might be something quirky and benignly eccentric about extreme collecting, but when you have to compete with broken down fridges for breathing space and piles of old margarine tubs for affection, you develop a less romantic idea of collecting. <coughs> Um, had I kept the entire content of my mother's bedroom as it was, maybe transferred it to an uh, art gallery, the result would have been overwhelming. A 60-year family history in textiles, including everything from darned underwear to my own cut-off ponytail. But some things are too close for comfort. It took me a week to empty the room, and I kept no more than fitted into a small suitcase. Some bits of fabric and a few evocative pieces a skirt made from flag material, a jumper of my father that he wore from before I was born till close to his death, a material manifestation of time contracted in memory, importing, as Bergson says, the past into the present, contracting into a single tuition, in, intuition many moments of duration. Uh, the jumper is solid and heavy, belying what is often described as the ephemeral nature of textiles. What strikes me when I hold it is how small it is and how small my father's role was in my life. It was knitted by my mother from the wool of a sheep that my father looked after before they got married. While the jumper shrunk with repeated washes, my father expanded as a result of the economic miracle in Germany. My father never got rid of that sheep and my mother never lost her tightly knitted grip over him. Flaubert's no novel, Bouval Pécouché, provides another warning how making collections in search of knowledge can slip out of control. So being both wary and knowledgeable with regard to collecting from own experience, for me making collections is not a lifestyle but strictly a research method. Some materials I acquire with a particular purpose in mind, but more often than not, what attracts me to an item of fabric is a rather vague potential I sense in it, something that grabs my imagination that is still quite unresolved, <coughs> fuzzy and difficult to pin down and articulate. In that sense, I col collect possibilities and potential of things to be. Uh, from what I find, feel and imagine, 
From my own and other people's material memories, I made, make artifacts and assemblages, assemblages, things to entice the narrative imagination and open up new meanings. Making, be that of concepts, text, or textiles, is not culture shaping nature, applying preconceived ideas to material, says Tim Ingold, but a reciprocal process of becoming between maker and material, better understood as weaving, which emphasizes movement as a truly generative of the object rather than merely revelatory of an object that is already present in an ideal conceptual or virtual form in advance of the process that discloses it. So making is world making, experience continually and endlessly coming into being around us as we weave. Making is weaving as narrative, as every movement, like every line in a story, grows rhythmically out of the one before and lays the groundwork for the next. So if, is make, if making is weaving, we might say that maybe in some way all artifacts are textiles. <coughs> For Kirsten Craft, weaving, done on a loom and limited by its size, is an activity of settled people, of stability, planning and geometrical form, lending itself to mechanization and thus leading to dominance of woven cloth over other fabrics, a dominance also apparent in the paradigms of weaving that underpin language and theory of Western civilizations, while the knitting of continuous yarn is a dimensional experience, an experience of infinity. It is useful to ponder such differences. There's a good reason why suits, shirts, curtains, and sheets are usually woven, while jumpers, socks, stockings, and vests are made from knitted fabric. <coughs> like in Penelope's weaving, so in knitting, time is marked, made, and coped with in the making. So whether we are weaving, knitting or stitching, drawing, painting or filmmaking, storytelling, Benjamin writes, is a craft. The artisan's task to fashion the raw material of existence, his own and that of others, in a solid, useful and unique way. The story, he says, bears the marks of the storyteller much as the earthen vessel bears the marks of the potter's hands. So our practices and projects are uh, embedded in our own experiences and life stories. For neurobiologist Matthew Belmonte, the bright yellow raincoat his mother made him wear as a child reminds him of his dependence on her, represents both order and protection. My theoretical and narrative constructions in science and art, he writes, are the same sort of protective gear as the impermeable coat that I once wore to primary school. They hold nature at arm's length, close enough so I can make sense of it, but far enough so I won't be overwhelmed. <coughs> the German author Erich Kästner, the only writer present at the burning of his own books on the fateful 10th of May 1933 in Berlin, realizes 10 years later when his flat is hit in an air raid and all his possessions are burned, the overwhelming feelings that arise from the loss of what might seem small and insignificant. Because what is lost is not only, as if that was not enough, material, utilitarian and symbolic value, but also relational value. The materialized effective bonds with his mother, things he thought that could never be burned. So in such memories, textile knowledge can be traced. The connectivity between body and object, textiles as physical manifestations of connectedness. The tears of pain and happiness, the sweat of anxiety and excitement, both part of the self and absorbed by the cloth. Perception and affection, inside and out, body and object interwoven in memory. Uh, just a couple of examples how knowledge emerges through thinking through the hands. In his childhood memories, 
Walter Benjamin links the mundane fabric of life to concepts of knowledge and keen observations of the everyday interwoven with flights of the imagination. In the crisp, creaseless sheets on his bed, he senses the comfort of a clear conscience. Enveloped in the transparent fabric world of the curtain, the child becomes a white ghost a breeze of, and a breeze of wind. In the linen, wardrobe, fairy tale powers from the past of weaving and spinning become palpable in everyday encounters. The rolled up socks in his bedroom drawer invite his curiosity. They look and feel like little bags with something inside, a present maybe. But when he puts his hand inside to pull out the present, the bag disappears. He can't get enough of this astonishing experiment. And it makes him realize that form and content are the same, and the truth needs to be teased out of text as gently and carefully as the child's hand pulls the sock out of the bag. There can hardly be a better story to make the case for practice-based research, for playful exploration and thinking through the hands in the quest for knowledge and understanding. Another example, um, an exhibition, the hyperbolic crochet coral reef, took place in 2008 at the Haywood Gallery in London, inspired by mathematician Diana Taimina's crochet models of hyperbolic space. Hyperbolic space, while common in nature, is so conceptually challenging that for a century, mathematicians were unable to visualize what this type of space might actually look like. There is no formula, formula that accurately describes it, so computers can't model it either. Having exhausted all traditional ways of model mating, Tamina resorted to the needlework skills she had learned as a child. Crochet proved to be the perfect and so far only way to create the potentially infinitely growing surface of hyperbolic space. So the solution for this conceptual problem had been sitting all along on the sideboard in the living room, yet it took over 100 years for the connection to be made between the familiar textile object and the abstract concept. To see the potential hyperbolic structure in the frills of the doily and to arrive at this more complex embodied way of thinking about the world both mathematically and physically. So, um, so it's in a way, it's a matter of how you look at things and the many ways to interpret, it, interpret what you see. For example, a collection of knitting patterns could be interpreted to foreshadow in an uncanny way contemporary issues and concerns such as childhood obesity and what causes it. Scare, scared children and scary ones. <laughs> Celebrity cults from Elvis to Dynasty. Drinking. Smoking. Uh, gun culture. The manly art of wearing a cardigan. And last not least, the disembodied mind. So, some of the materials I've collected are related to text in the textile files, a card index and archive simultaneously published as a weblog. But what about the rest? How can the collected materials be ordered without losing the richness of their actual and potential meanings? There is always more in textiles than can be neatly fitted into concepts, slippage, overflow, potential exceeding rationales, transitions unaccounted for in theory, frameworks that can be ignorant, as Carolyn Steedman notes, of the material stepping stones of our escapes, such as clothes, shoes, and makeup. Uh, Janice Jeffries uses the term of labored cloth. Fabric and fabrications are always labored in many ways, from production to daily use, made, cared for, altered, put to new uses in different and always changing circumstances. A sheet can carry the weight of child labor in its weave, of family values of cleanliness and caring, give comfort and protection, be a den or turn a child into a ghost, become screen or banner, ripped into strips, 
to dress wounds, knot it into a rope to end a life or escape into a new one, can be a transitional object or make a statement in the art gallery, stained or crisp, fluttering on the washing line or fold in the linen cupboard, it sparks of memories, dreams and flights of the imagination. <coughs> In a poem by Bertolt Brecht, when a revolt against labor conditions is crushed, a sheet stained red by the blood of the worker shot dead by the storm troops replaces the red flag of freedom on the factory roof. Wholeness and happiness before things were torn apart can be remembered in a sheet. So whether sheet, jumper or sock, the textiles of everyday life are hybrids on the move, sometimes bearing the physical traces of the body's action and experience, but I suggest always storied, always part of and embodying visibly or imagined living experience. They are, to borrow a ter term from Bruno Latour, hairy, networky things in many senses. A sock can become a concept through playful exploration, as in Benjamin's story. It can be memory made art, as in Waltraud Mattern's work, The Father I Never Knew, who remembers her father through a pair of soldier's socks he pulled over her boots when he put her to bed so it would be quicker to take the children to the shelter when there were air raids during the night. A sock unexpectedly can slip into a narrative gap in disturbing ways. I read once that during the Nazi regime in Germany, there were plans to use hair taken from concentration camp inmates to make socks for submarine crews and footwear for railway workers. There's no evidence that this ever happened, but as my father served on a submarine and my grandfather worked for the railway, imagining their feet in those socks became unbearable, slipping at a, inadvertently into a deep and disturbing narrative gap. The question so many Germans, the children of the silent and abetting majority, have been asking so many times of what our parents did, knew, or indeed wore during the war. Oops. Um, but we can't, uh, so hairy things with fuzzy edges from the bedroom drawer or retreat from a website, everyday textiles conceptually and materially overspill and slip in constant movement and shifting meanings. But we can't leave it at that. The collection needs a shape, a form that reflects its content, a framework. If we ground everyday textiles in particular concepts, be that social history, psychoanalysis, or women's studies, we arrest their moving and changing qualities, and they become instrumentalized within the concept's parameters, losing the fluidity and multiplicity of meanings that made them so interesting in the first place. The difficulty with movement is, says Bergson, how to grasp it without stopping it. Philosophy, Masumi says, prolongs the thought path of movement and decontextualizes. It takes singularities out of their context and makes virtual connections between them, pure linkage without the link. It is, Masumi says, the task of philosophy to hold on to the surprise that escapes from habit, where the everyday, the usual, the obvious, become wondrous in a process of miraculation. This sense of wonder of the extraordinary in the ordinary emerges from stories and memories of everyday textile experience. But philosophy not only abstracts from context, but also from materiality. So to grasp textile knowledge, understanding better is not enough. We also need to feel more and move between one and the other. As Jacques Daigneault says, balance reflection in ways that enable us to jump from feeling to concept and the converse. The past, Proust writes, is somewhere beyond the reach of the intellect, but unmistakably present in some material object. In the affective dimensions, the stories of our life always exceed what can be said in words. Sensory knowledge is lived and felt, but 
In the hyperliterate world of academia, David House writes, it would seem to be the fate of the senses that the astonishing power to reveal and engage should forever be sentenced in the court of language. So the multisensory nature of textile knowledge cannot be captured by words or visuals alone. It touches the skin, enters through the nose, makes sounds and has taste. It needs not just a philosophical but a material concept of wonder. So practice-based research concerned with knowledge beyond the word may be a relatively recent and still somewhat controversial newcomer to academia, but arts-based practices of scholarship have their own long tradition, reaching back into the predisciplinary quests for knowledge in the 16th century Wunderkammer, the cabinet of wonders, art and curiosity. Wunderkammer collections first appeared at the beginning of the 16th century, rapidly spreading across Central Europe, and nearly a thousand were recorded in the 1560s on the continent alone. In 2008, I visited the oldest surviving Wunderkammer in Europe, in Halle, Germany. Uh, founded in 1698 as a hands-on learning resource for the children, both of the poor and the rich educated in the schools of the foundation, it features a textile cabinet with, among other things, thread from twisted asbestos and animal sinews, and fabric samples for the students to learn about textures and fibers. In the everyday culture cabinet, there was food to be tried and an over 250 year old Hungarian cheese is still on display. Thinking about how storage technologies continue to become obsolete with the risk of data and memories being lost in the process, as far as archiving the past is concerned, the Wunderkammer might still have the last word. The 16th century Wunderkammer collections were inspired by the desire to recreate the richness and variety of the universe in eclectic arrangements of artifacts so that the order of the macrocosm could be studied and grasped in the microcosm of the collection. So right from the start, the collection was also a concept of knowledge and, Horst Bredekamp says, the apparent disorder of the collection items reveals their philosophical significance within this framework. In other words, the Wunderkammer does not represent the world as unified and coherent. On the contrary, the aim of the scholars of the past was, much as that of researchers at present, to find patterns, links, and relations in its apparent disorder, and thus better understand its complexity. Uh, the cabinet already made a case for what since has been accepted across disciplines, that there is no single universe or single truth, but that the world is in scientific terms a multiverse, or in narrative terms one of multiple truths. Displaying natural and artificial objects side by side, the Wunderkammer presented a nature-culture continuum, which only relatively recently has been rediscovered in academic discourse. Uh, workshops, labs, and libraries were often attached, making the Wunderkammer a hands-on learning resource center and interdisciplinary practice-based research facility. Forerunner to universities, museums, and galleries, the Wunderkammer is also credited uh, as a predecessor to the internet. Both, Francis Turpak says, employ the visual as the primary mode of interaction, and both collect and link far-flung and disparate ideas in new and ever-changing configurations. The legacy of the cabinet, Barbara Stafford says, extends into cyberspace and personal computers, both all-purpose appliances and ludic experimental products for the construction and communication of alternative worlds. So while the world was God's playground, inside the cabinet, the researcher was emulating divine playfulness taking playful pleasure in artificial creation, not primarily guided by usefulness. With the advance of the Enlightenment, the wondrous was supplanted by a desire to impose a more rational order onto the world. Collections became specialized following the trend to socialize like with like in newly created classes. 
Most cabinets were dismantled, their content finding its way either into the newly formed museums of science and natural history, into libraries, art galleries, or onto the scrap heap of history, yet their legacy has endured. After my study visit to Germany, I discovered right on my doorstep another cabinet, untouched by and oblivious to contemporary discourse and trends, the Musgrave Collection in Eastbourne. George Musgrave, born in 1914, started collecting, he says, because of the poverty of his childhood when he was eight, and his museum, he tells the story of his life and times in objects, artifacts, and paintings. Among other things, he designed toy figures and cake decorations, invented the double yellow line, worked as a missionary, was involved in politics and sports, went on expeditions to research the life of St. Paul's, and made films and wrote books. And there is a sewing box in his uh, cabinet that also happens to be a stamp collection. So my own, um, like, my, like its predecessors, my own cabinet, Mirabilia Domestica, is a gathering of things for curious hands and minds to explore, an archive of material knowledge, an aesthetic experience, and a space for imagining and creating meaning. And it is dedicated to the small things in life, so often overlooked through habit, yet, like Krakauer's miniature occurrences and tiny catastrophes, bearing heavily on our being and becoming. So the Wunderkammer, while only recently rediscovered as a model of knowledge beyond the word, has always been an inspiration for artists, that yet the rules of the modern museum and gallery have impinged on the concept, privileging the visual, prohibiting touch, and keeping the visitors at bay. Um, in the Wunderkammer and early museum, it was common practice, indeed deemed necessary, to examine things through touch. The light that strikes my eye, Herda wrote, can no more give me access to concepts such as solidity, hardness, softness, smoothness, form, shape, or volume, than my mind can generate embodied living concepts by independent thinking. Touch also provided a link, an intimate link, to the artifact's maker or user, bridging, as if by magic, distances of time and space. So the Wunderkammer challenges both the logocentric bias of, academica, of academia and the oculus centricity of the visual arts. Touch is always reciprocal. We cannot touch without being touched. Enriching our experience, our touch also affects the object and is therefore taboo in the institutions whose main remit is preservation. On the artifact as a temporary arrangement of matter, always on its, on its way to being something else, the marks of entropy are our memory traces. The threadbare fabric, a reminder of life lived, Stains and holes, marks of experience. Another little story here. So in the white space of the modern gallery and the glass cases of the museum, the wonders of creation are displayed for the eyes alone, out of the visitor's reach, as if in a static tableau. The Wunderkammer, in contrast, Stafford writes, was a drama of possible relationships to be explored, not only through mind and eye, but through all the senses. <clears throat> in Mirabilia Domestica, like in the cabinets of the past, there are boxes and drawers to be opened. We cannot know in advance how what we will find will affect us. The opening of the box may release a genie, an unexpected jolt, or a story of magic and metamorphosis or desire and danger. Rather than a mere display of wondrous things, the Wunderkammer is an auspicious place for wonder to emerge and be felt a site of transformation. What matters most is not container or content, 
but the movement opening one and revealing the other, it is in the action that meaning is made. The visitor is no longer a detached observer, but an acting participant. Newer scientific evidence suggests that we act half a second before we think. The reasoning mind, always lagging behind the body's action, making sense in retrospect. As one half second gap seamlessly flows into the next, we become aware that we live not just in a lifetime of experience shaped by words, but simultaneously in a parallel universe, a sensory realm of becoming that forever pre precedes its verbalization. Um. The Wunderkammer welcomes paradoxes and uncertainties, encourages stories in the making that feed not only on what is there, but even more so perhaps on absence and gaps in between left for the work of the imagination. The cabinet provides an intellectual environment and poetic space to think and feel about the world in a different way. Where the growing quantity of knowledge once led to specialization and the establishment of disciplinary borders, the growing complexity of knowledge now calls for moves across it. Textile knowledge has a Mirabilia Domestica, its own particular learning resource center, not instead, but in addition to institutionalized cousins in universities and museums to both complement and subvert. And the richer and more mysterious its content, the more threads of attachment for links to be made, be that to scholarly pursuit or personal life story, or blurring the boundaries between them. For me, the quirky and eclectic cabinet of curiosity is a pocket of resistance, not against established institutions of knowledge per se, but resisting the instrumentalization of art as a panacea to deal with matters other methods can't reach be that in the service of social justice and integration or urban re regeneration. Indeed, putting art into the service of the state has its own troubled history. A pocket of resistance, too, to the demands of spectacular impact and loud statements dominating the contemporary art scene, with its attention to the small things in life, the Wunderkammer promotes a quietly considerate and more intimate engagement with the textures and wonders of the world. So now, two and a half years later, some of my cabinet, cabinet's content has been sold, some recycled, some shown again, some has traveled and the rest has stayed at home. So did I for a while hit out of the blue by the blues of postdoctoral depression, followed somewhat fittingly by taking my work to the Freud Museum, where some of the objects from my cabinet merged with a different sort of memory fabric. Some new characters were introduced, transitional presences from the edge of consciousness, such as Mothman and Birdman and Birdchild and Mutton Men, twilight creatures caught up in a process of metamorphosis. And there's a substory here, unbeknown to the spectator, because the nightgowns on display once belonged to my grandfather, who was a passive supporter of the regime that forced Freud to move to London to save his life in the first place. So there's a subversive edge to it that lends ambiguity always to art interventions, almost regardless of whether they are disclosed and declared or merely, merely sensed. Freud, collector of stories and things, acknowledged his debt to the arts. This nightgown, by the way, is much older, given to me by a woman whose ancestors planted, harvested, and spun the flax, wove the linen, and made up the garment. It's a boy's nightgown of the type Freud himself, son of a wool merchant who fell into poverty, might have worn when he was young. So every thread, a story yarn, be it of realities of the imagination. Freud's daughter Anna, the weaver, meanwhile would knit while listening to her patient's stories. So the 
exhibition at the Freud Museum put an end to my memory work for the time being and marked a return to or a leap forward into a more imaginary and less reminiscing engagement with the wonders of the world. My interest in material narratives that are multisensory, that touch and can be touched, continues. Um, indeed, one of my new ventures is the Mermaid Project, and the first works have been shown on two occasions to audiences of blind and visually impaired people. Uh, that's the mermaid trap that includes the tinkling of silver bells and the sound of pebbles on the beach. And, and is somewhat ambiguous as uh, it could be understood as a device to catch mermaids or a device for mermaids to capture the souls of sailors and hearts of pirates. This is the mermaid's love nest. And here we have got the mermaid purses. And both the mermaid purses and the love nest contain elements that can't be seen but only perceived by those who dare to touch. I'm interested in works that are long-term and open-ended and transcend my personal skills. In other words, collaborative ventures that combine very different approaches and seek touching points to arrive at something amazing yet to be defined. For the Mermaid Project, I would like to bring together images and objects with evocative and poetic writing inspired by the theme with an erotic edge to it. Um, new digital technologies have opened up potential for new collaborations and through a serendipitous encounter on a professional online Platform. I've teamed up with a digital artist in Canada to bring together material and digital threads in new ways to create wondrous multisensory environments. Our first collaboration combines previous work, the butterflies from the Freud Museum, symbol of the psyche, embarking on the magic carpet on a flight through the mysterious hyper-abstract worlds, created by Titus Hora, illuminated lens, mindscapes of rich jeweled colors, strange shapes and textures. Programmatically generated, they resist the mind's urge to find meaning at first glance and instead invite the eye and the imagination to wander and linger. Surrounding the magic carpet, hovering in mid-air with its passengers in search of destinies and destinations, these images provide windows to wondrous worlds yet to be explored. Okay. Um, out of such conversations, the Cassandra project was born. At this moment in time, in my hands, with a yet uncertain future with regard to with whom and how it will develop. The first stage is a blog that combines imagery and writing in a poetic and evocative way. Uh, the theme, broadly speaking, is how we engage with hopes, fears, thoughts and feelings vis-à-vis -vis an uncertain future. Um, a meandering approach open to possibilities and new departures. The blog is a prelude um, which will be followed by premonitions in a different format and finally resulting in a multi-sensory installation of prophecies. Um, new conversations across different media and locations are always emerging. I've started a new one now with a Spanish artist who's also an ophthalmologist and develops technologies of 3D photography to create wondrous objects. So whether we will work together on Cassandra or perhaps on a different project altogether remains to be seen. There are, after all, no limits to the art of the narrative imagination. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, I, I realized that when I introduced Solveig, I forgot to mention that we are taping this session, okay? And so please, 
um, when we are discussing, I hope, it, I hope you're okay with that, and it, keep in mind that this um, is being taped, and that's part of the larger project, which is to make all of the events that, um, that we at Novella put on, to make them more widely accessible. Um, and there's a really very wonderful and active uh, website. So, thank you. Anyway, um, that's just a gorgeous paper. And if I can make you envious just for a minute, can you imagine these supervisions that we would used to have? Where seriously, where Maria Tambuku was the other um, supervisor, and Solve would come in and she would be quite laden down with these with these objects. Okay, that you've seen pictures of, and the photographs are so gorgeous. But you talk about memory. My mind. We would just we would be like children at Christmas, you know, really wanting to unpack it. And so that it's a late office. I'm going to show you this. And they, these objects are the most physically uh, inviting and tantalizing. And it's just wonderful to hear what you've been doing after your PhD. It's, it's really great. Anyway, I, I so much enjoyed listening to you. So please, um, questions, comments, any contributions? Speechless. <laughs> the imaginations are flying and they're sort of hitting in space. Thank you very much. One of the things that really struck me when you began talking was the parallels between um, fabric and clothes and um, uh, the way in which consumption more broadly is, is um, said to be the story of a life, mm -hmm. like in mean, sort of a narrative construction mm -hmm. or identity and so on. And um, I wondered if you could say something about whether you see fabric and all things woven into it, and those wonderful metaphors that you um, laid out for us, as something different or just a subset of consumption. Uh, I would think it's the other way around. Consumption <laughs> is a subset of uh, things and of textiles, I think, yes. Um, I, I rarely think about textiles as consumption. I suppose uh, it's sort of a different angle. But even there, I think textiles are different, probably different from other things. Because, I mean, if you think about, especially in this country, the second-hand culture, and if you what is recycled usually second hand shop it's textiles clothes and books that's what, you know, that's sort of the main thing and people are very um, well i don't know it's it's um it's a bit diff difficult to th well i mean there are different angles to it because people can feel very attached to and very a textile can be very precious to them and people keep things from grandparents or whatever but at the same time uh, we have got sort of a throwaway textile culture, no? But, well, I don't know. I, th I, I really think about it in terms of consumption, I must say. Mm. But I think it's... Well, yeah, I have to think about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. uh, Well, I did a questionnaire. I did a questionnaire where I asked people about everyday textiles and stories. So quite a lot of the quotes that where it says from, well, which are just from people who sent me their stories. And what often happened is that people would say, I, I, wouldn't, I don't know anything because uh, I can't think of anything. And then suddenly sort of things came up and uh, because it's something you don't usually think about a lot. So I did questionnaires in English, German, and Spanish, and just sort of emailed them out to friends of mine who passed them on. It is not a very sort of uh, empirically considered method, just sort of throw them out there and see what comes back. And yeah, I got lots of interesting stories. And also, once you start thinking about it, you come across them all the time. So people would cut out bits out of the papers or no, I mean, like this story with the man who was shooting his neighbor's underwear. I just saw that in the paper coming back from one of our supervisions in the metro or whatever it was. So, I mean, once you you are onto something, you see it everywhere. And uh, I just sort of collected things, yes, things and stories and related them. People also gave me lots of things. Uh, 
strange things and underpants elastic from their, their grandmother had in a sewing box or whatever, all kinds of things really. And objects, because yeah, often people have things that they don't want to throw out, but they don't really know what to do with them either. So it became sort of a place where people would just give me things. Yeah. You should look, I mean, Solveig put the, um, the address on there, but the, yes. the, the, this, this textile file that Solveig made is, is really wonderful. And I have to say, it's, um, you find yourself getting drawn in as you didn't the dip. So I hadn't really thought that taking on Solveig as my PhD student would involve me giving her a ripped up bit of a sheet that we had been given as a wedding present. Okay, but so and you really you know you realize that you have all these things exactly in this category. But well, I'm not gonna use that anymore, but it's quite special and yes. it has, your, your red silk blouse yeah, well, and, that is yeah, in the yeah, Cassandra project also, I mean, now. You know, so you realize that you're sort of taking... So it's not... I mean, more often in narrative research, you really are collecting stories, and if not stories, word-based things, okay? It's not always the case, but it's very often the case. But in your, in the case with Solveig, as you can see, it's it's also very much... Okay, I'm sorry, I'm, should, I'm supposed to be chairing. No, no, no. But, but I'm, really, I'm, I'm warning people as well, that you'll get quite... Um, Taken in as well to, to participate. Yes. Um, it's been a follow-on question. Quite a few of the quotes that you put up seem to be very early evocative memories from childhood. Yes. Was that a common experience, or did you deliberately <coughs> seek that out? Um, well, at the time while I was doing the research, there was a project on about. Uh, on Radio 4, I think, BBC, the Memory Project. So I got very interested in that, and you could search the database with keywords. I put in curtain, for example, or, and all the memories, well, most of the memories that came up there were childhood memories. So I used them as well, yes, in addition to it. Because I think uh, first memories are, are often textile-related, it seems to me. And I mean, what was also quite interesting that there and there was a follow-up, I think, by the BBC later, that lots of people talked about memories that were really too early for them to have had them, because you are supposed to only have autobiographical memories once you are three and once you have acquired language. And there were all those things, these prem memories. And they did a follow-up on that because psychologists were not very happy with that because they're not supposed to exist, and people insisted that they could remember this lavender stuffed in their... Uh, baby grow and whatever, so yes, it seemed, well, it makes sense really that first memories would be textile memories because uh, your world is still quite small no, when you're in a push chair and things, so yes, lots of childhood memories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was very interested about the example you gave of the Vuvuka, mm -hmm. and particularly in what you said about towards the enlightenment and uh, this as a storage of information, as a storage of knowledge, became transferred uh, in a rationalistic manner in the mm. libraries and the libraries and so on. And I was also quite intrigued by this relation that you drew between the Vulgar Power and the internet. Mm. So could you also say then, to bring that back, that mm. uh, the internet has the potential to be a source of uh, storage for knowledge or information which has uh, the same irrational uh, properties of the Wunderkammer. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose it has, no? because I mean, the Wunderkammer, there were these places packed full of stuff which was sometimes ordered, sometimes not, but in not often very clear ways, and it's a bit like, so I mean, if you walk around there and look things, and one thing leads you to another, which is pretty much what you do when you are Googling, no? you sort of are with something, and then you get sidetracked by something else, and there and there are sort of things that might be valuable bits of knowledge and others that are not at all, and it's sort of, it's just an odd collection of stuff, really. So, yes, yes, I quite, uh, and actually, well, now this Wunderkammer concept seems to be quite fashionable again. I mean, just if you Google it, there are all kinds of Wunderkammer things coming up, blogs and websites, and it has become very trendy again, I think, the Wunderkammer idea. Yeah. No, 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 not it because does of seem more, It does seem rather recently. I have to say. It was, yeah, it is rather recently. I was surprised myself, actually, but there seems to be an awful and books as well that make these connections, mm -hmm. like Ausbredekamp and 
Barbara Stafford. So there are quite interesting books that make the, follow these connections up him. Yes. Um, I think this might be a bit of a meandering question, which I know you're <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> having a problem with. Um, but I was interested when you said quite a few times that this, this right to meander and pursue mm -hmm. that we're interested in. Um, and you sort of once, twice referenced as though this stood you outside sort of the, the academic um, processes and mm -hmm. routines. How did you have any form of constraints to help you <laughs> besides your super? How did no, you? Molly wasn't uh, very happy this, with it. You know, such a wide, you know, every, every one thing leads to another, you know, like yeah. leaves on the forest. How did you? How did you go forward? What were any of those things, even though you didn't want them? <laughs> well, I mean, Does yes. that make sense? my supervisors were not terribly happy with me undoing. It's not true that we weren't happy, but I have to say, it was. It, can I say one thing? Yeah, you just, say something. Yeah, well, because there, you when you're doing a PhD, you are aware that, in fact, to get a PhD, it's going to be examined. So you have to. So at one level, you know, and as a supervisor, as many people in this room are and have been, uh, part of your responsibility is you feel that you need to help guide your student to create something that will, in fact, ultimately be accepted in an academic audience. So it is so true. That, I mean, so they would have these incredible objects and writings, and, and you were just like, swimming in this very rich sea, but, and I was the one who was doing this, um, I would constantly say, be saying, okay, well, this word meandering, how does that translate into already existing concepts of how you go about exploring, you know, worlds of people, etc., and, and trying to encourage Solveig to tie that back into, into stuff which already does exist um, in, in in the world of scholarship. And so we would have this debate, but I, I personally didn't feel like it was a problem. It was like, for me, it was quite interesting because ultimately Solveig was doing a PhD, a practice-based PhD. So there is this kind of challenge to marry these traditions in a way that will be both recognizable as, a, as something which is artistic and practice-based, but also very much, as you can see, very much scholarly PhD and this was a challenge. Mm. I mean I think you you did it yeah. wonderfully yeah. and you know well one thing that I did is um, I looked for people backing up my point about the meandering. So once you again once you look for it there are people to talk about meandering and why it's a good idea. And I mean that's one of the secrets of research anyway. No? I mean if you say something it might not be recognized but once you have got sort of a few written accounts and uh, other academics who back that up, it becomes a different matter. So yes, that was one thing I did. And I mean, well, <coughs> yes, you have to sort of, uh, I think especially if you work as an artist and you have got everything planned and you have got your clear outcome in mind already, you're not getting very far. I mean, it just, uh, you wouldn't be doing what you would be doing otherwise, so it restricts you. So I had to sort of, uh, yes, reconcile those both things really, which yeah worked well in the end. Can I say something as well? Because one of our ongoing debates was, you know, to what extent not to dichotomize these different yes. worlds, right? And and to because I, I think at the end of the day that's not such an interesting thing to do. And I think and so all these work really shows how a, a, a much more interesting picture than that. I hope it's okay to say here, I think in the end, um, in, in the process of examination, it doesn't necessarily always boil down to that, you know, I, I think it's fair to say that the academic examiner was more open to meandering as yes. a method than the artist. Yes, yes. Okay? Yes, Who but that's, yes, but I think that that's a, that's a very peculiar problem with a practice-based PhD, and I've noticed that, and other people have had the same experience, that uh, artist academics, to call them something or other, often uh, feel they have to be more academic than other academics to justify the whole art thing, which has sort of 
reputation of not being very academic and scientific. But here's the thing. So they often overdo it. I mean, mm -hmm. I, for example, I went uh, to lots of conferences while I was doing it, and it. Um, and one conference was about practice-based uh, research and was all artists. There were hardly any images. It was all sort of heavy quotations and very, very over-academic. Whereas when I went to social scientist conferences, it was quite different. They were, they were all very interested in visuals and senses. So, yes, I mean, you can't sort of have, make sort of... Re yeah, it's, it's sometimes it works in a different way than you would expect, really, yes. Mm -hmm. And I also think what you were saying about how in this academic world you often have to find, you try to find somebody else who's done this before, but now you have done this, right? Yes. Now <laughs> I have used your work and, 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 and referred people to you, and that many times actually, because you really were trying to do something that was very, very hard to do fully well, mm -hmm. okay? Not, mm -hmm. not just for an artist community or an academic yeah, scholarly, rigorous, mm. you know, in that mind way, and you've done that now, and mm. and that's what and and but it, but that's I think also it was very hard, very mm. tough, swimming against the grain, as yeah. lots of very original work is. Yeah, I think the problem is that there are no sort of clear rules or anything really. The practice-based PhD is sort of strange hybrid. Nobody quite knows, and everybody does different things. I mean, my practical work would very different from what someone else might do. So it's not a, everything is sort of up in the air and needs to be negotiated all the time. And, and in the end, it's at least twice as much work, I mean, many times in between me and other people in this a similar situation. I said, I wish I'd never done a practice-based PhD just because the writing is just the same amount in the end. Well, I mean, you can write less, but I mean, that just means you have to do more editing. It's not less work, really. It's so. And then you have to know all the practical problems. Where do you do your exhibitions and how and all this stuff I was carrying mm -hmm. around. And how to get a storage place for it in the university because it's not sort of, you know, you are supposed to have a little desk or something, but you don't, I mean, you know, the file for the cupboard. And the critical part of the examination is actually, yeah. is, is the examiners visiting the exhibition. Yeah, so you get two vivas, two, you, you do twice as much at least. So. Sorry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'll just come back to memory. I mean, yes. um, you know, a couple of people have asked questions already about memory. And um, you call the talk, it, it's got memory. <coughs> and one of the things about narrative and the narrative weaving of threads that you're talking about is temporality, as, mm -hmm. you, as you know. And um, the story of textiles and so on is quite clear, clearly temporal, and if you remember in their childhood and so on. <laughs> But I notice you call your blog um, Cassandra's knowledge, and Cassandra is the prophetess. Mm -hmm. And the other part of narrative um, theory that I really like is that it links the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if we could say something about how the, the narrative imagination that comes from this textile remembering um, does that, or if that wasn't apparent in what people had to say and how they use them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I think uh, the, the project I did with the textile memories, well, that was sort of more about the past, really. Yes, it was sort of exploring how memory is made uh, and how memory is felt and experienced and kept and whatever. And I think after having done that for so many years, and being, and it was a very personal work as well. It was my family memories and stuff and stories. And um, I found it quite depressing after a while or by the end of it. So apart from being worn out by the process, but uh, and I just needed to separate myself from it and just start something that has nothing to do with memories, but is imagination. imagination. So that's where the mermaids come in and Cassandra and it just sort of... Uh, putting an end to something, in the end, it comes together again, and I can see that already, how it does. And, uh, but uh, for me, it was really a break with the past that I just badly needed. So, um, but obviously, just as I said that um, 
the, the embodied self or the memories are not sort of naked uh, entities but are closed in some way. So also are the imaginations, I suppose, and the, and the future, and not what you think about it. And so, um, yes, so I think it's a different, well, it's a continuity, really, yes. Yes, because if we think about our future selves, or, or just about stories, or, um, yes, they are also closed in something, in environments and textiles, and yeah. I think we have talk, well, we'll put two last questions we have for you. Please. Um, I mentioned about time as well. I mentioned your point about you come up touch without being touched. Yes. Well, I work in the cultural heritage sector with archives and museum collections. Yeah. And you mentioned entropy and you mentioned yes. loss. But what is your response to change over time? I mean, these artifacts are going to change over time. You can see it as lost, you may see it as change in different ways of yes. etc. How do you view that whole yes, agenda? How yes. Do you make the idea accessible for the now and Yes, I think, well, I mean, at the time I was sort of uh, <coughs> uh, visiting, uh, well, going to sort of several seminars at the British Museum where they talked about collections and, and uh, what became pretty apparent is that there's actually too much stuff that is preserved. So there's a surplus and, and I mean, uh, I think that was Jack Lohmann from the... Uh, Museum of London or something, he said, we are getting so much stuff, we, we don't accept um, donations anymore. Things have to come up, be something really special for us to take them on. So I'm thinking, well, if there's so much stuff, um, why not let people touch some rather? Than, so it's not like you would get people grabbing uh, whatever very rare and special things that are in the collection. I mean, it's, not everything needs to be touched, obviously but more things could be touched. And because I work with blind and visually impaired people, obviously it's very much on my mind. And, uh, and with contemporary art, well, I mean, there's so much art being made to destroy, be destroyed anyway. Uh, it's just um, a question of starting to think about it. Does it really make sense that something can't be touched? Or is it just a, well, I mean, often it's an insurance issue with many things. I'm, uh, I'm going to okay. um, let us just have one last question from Francis, because it's almost really 2.30. Okay. Um, as you're saying, I'm um, interested in what you're saying about sensory knowledge being tacit knowledge. And I wondered what questions you found most successful in getting people to speak about their textile memories. Whether you found it difficult to do. Um, well, I just sent them sort of like a questionnaire, so they're just and I said, well, you can sort of answer these questions or just write your stories. And most of them would just sort of write me letters and some were quite moved and, and got really sort of and said, nobody has ever asked me about this and I've got all these stories. So I just let people tell them me the stories in their own way. I did some interviews, a couple of interviews with textile artists as well, actually. But mostly it was just people sending me letters and emails with the stories. So obviously, if they didn't respond well, they might have had their reason, or some said also that they couldn't think of anything first, and and it took them some time. And then once they started writing, they were very moved almost by their own memories because, yeah, I mean, some things you wouldn't think about it if you are not being asked. So the asking is quite important, I think. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, thank you so much, everyone. And please, before we thank Solve, please do remember to fill in their evaluation forms and join me in thanking Solveig for a great session.